Malleus Monstrorum is a two-volume bestiary for the Call of Cthulhu RPG published in 2020 by Chaosium. The original Malleus Monstrorum was created by Scott David Anielowski and published in 2006 as a single volume. This newer edition is keyed to the 7th edition of Call of Cthulhu, but it should be noted that all supplements for Call of Cthulhu going back to the 1st edition have remarkable backwards compatibility. Volume 1 of this version contains all the Cthulhu's Mythos monsters, while Volume 2 has all the Mythos deities. If you've read through the 7th edition Keeper's rulebook, then you know that Chaosium has already presented a pretty usable array of Mythos beasties, with 30 monsters and 27 deities. But between the two volumes in the Malleus Monstrorum, you're presented with a mind-boggling 81 monsters, 52 folklore creatures and zoo-type animals, and about 118 deities, avatars, and unique mythos entities. I'll try to address each of these two volumes one at a time here. The authors offer some very useful tips for using mythos monsters and entities. One, they should be presented to investigators using all the senses and sight should be used sparingly, at least at first. This is to preserve the mystery and heighten the horror for your players. Two, the names of the monsters should never be revealed outright and obfuscated as much as possible. To this end, there are several alternate names to every monster listed in this book. Three, combat should involve maneuvers as much as attacks, and even though attacks each have only one name, they should vary in description as much as possible. There is also a really great section on creating your own monster from random tables. The 81 Mythos monsters are presented in alphabetical order without any subcategories, but they are cross-listed at the beginning of the book in their old, familiar categories of servitor races, independent races, and others. They include a pronunciation guide for these names, but only at the end of the book and not at each individual entry, which I did find a bit cumbersome. Okay, so here's the deal. I read as many of these entries as carefully as I could before my brain turned to mush. My conclusion was that it seemed like a lot of the creatures shared the similarity of starting off human looking and then manifesting into their monstrous form. Another theme was that a lot of them seemed to be a giant blob of gross, writhing parts. To be fair, a lot of the entries are unique and interesting, and some of the creatures get really special attention, such as the Chthonians, Deep One variants, Shoggoths, and Migos. Note, Amigo is not your friend. I had a couple of hang-ups as I read through. One was the lack of illustrations. The illustrations that are included are great. They are full color and mostly top notch, but you're only getting about one in five monsters illustrated. I can almost guarantee that their rationale for this was that they didn't want to reveal the horror of each monster by visually representing it and thereby diminishing the potential of the imaginations of the players. But it probably had a lot more to do with the project budget, which I can empathize with personally. The biggest problem here is that Unless you memorize the descriptions of dozens of these weirdly named creatures, or find images of them online, print them out and tape them into your book, then you as a keeper simply cannot flip through the book to find the kind of monster you want to use in your game. It's not a browsable tome in the immediate visual sense. Somewhat oddly, there is a section with 15 creatures from folklore, none of which are mythos creatures. To be fair, they could all fit into a Call of Cthulhu investigation, and it's nice to have the 70 stat blocks for them. Maybe less helpful, but at least worth a chuckle, is the 37 or so regular animals that have been statted at the end of the book. I'm at a loss to justify why there are stats for every conceivable subtype of predatory cat and four different species of shark and a snapping turtle. Okay, so maybe regular animals serve as a good warm-up encounter for investigators who are spoiling for a fight but aren't ready for the big mythos beastie yet. You can throw some birds and moose at them. The second book of Malleus Monstrorum is a bit more precise in terms of its theme. It takes all the Great Ones, Outer Gods, Elder Gods, and their avatars, as well as one-off entities, and throws them into one huge alphabetical pile of about 120 entries. The author stress at the beginning of this book that the mythos is unknowable to humankind and to make any firm claims about the canon would be an error. They say in no uncertain terms that the Cthulhu mythos is yours. They even go so far as to encourage inconsistency regarding the gods as long as the story arcs are different. 
Their aim is to encourage the best possible experience at the table, not the preservation of any perceived mythos canon. One of the chief causes of the willy-nilly nature of the mythos, of course, is that it's been cobbled together from a long string of short stories spanning decades by a long list of authors, starting with H.P. Lovecraft. It's just inherently not going to be a consistent universe, and the folks at Chaosium are saying in no uncertain terms that you shouldn't stress out about it. But despite this, the theme of the deity's book is solid. What you have here are entities that pretty much all fit the following criteria. They are gross. You rarely see beauty in any of these deities or avatars, and when there is beauty, it's really just a ploy to deceive. They are deadly. As much as Call of Cthulhu really isn't heavily focused on combat, every god in this mythos is statted out with hit points and attacks. That's just a convention of the game itself and always has been. For the most part though, the investigators will die in a direct encounter with these entities, and they will never, ever actually kill them. At best, the entity is banished or disassociates or escapes and reforms elsewhere. They are multiplanar. I don't want to get lost in the weeds on this point, but the authors write that most of these entities have only one foot in our dimension, so to speak. What we think we're seeing may only be a cognitive construct inside of our own minds, trying to make sense of what our visual cortex is simply incapable of fully processing. As for presentation, Volume 2 has the same problems as the first volume, namely the lack of illustrations for every entry precludes a keeper from being able to quickly browse the book for the flavor of nasty creature they want to use. On a positive note, each entry has a format that goes above and beyond those of the monster entries in the previous book. You not only get the basic stat block with the attacks and maneuvers, but a description of each of the entity's possible cult followings, their aura or presence, blessings they might bestow to their followers, and an in-depth description of what an encounter with them would be like. It's worth mentioning that Nyarlahotep gets a startling amount of love in this book, a whopping 23 pages that covers its avatars and other aspects of its multifaceted existence. This is probably because one of the writers of this book also co-wrote Masks of Nyarlahotep, a 666-page super supplement for Call of Cthulhu. Okay, so here are my thoughts on the two-volume Malleus Monstrorum cons. Encyclopedia layout. Exactly one monster for every page or two would have been much easier to use as a keeper. Instead, almost every entry is broken up across page breaks, and it's tough to separate out individual entries. Illustrations for only some entries. This certainly helps to keep the unknowable truly unknowable, at least at a glance. Pros. The illustrations that are included are exceptional. They are like the finished product of the sketch style artwork found in the Keeper's Guide. The breadth of the project is authoritative and all-inclusive. If I have a question about a Cthulhu Mythos monster, this is probably the first place I'm going to go to now. I mean, I think the stat blocks that set these creatures up for a fight are sometimes laughably out of place, but the writing in this book is based on very credible source material and contains a lot of great little details. The split between monsters and deities avoids the burden of a single massive tome. A book for keepers. It's the little things. The alternative names are great for reinforcing mystery, and the fact that they included special sections for every deity like aura, encounter, cults, and blessings means they were really trying to make this a tool for keepers rather than just a thinly disguised lore dump. Ultimately, this two book set is an encyclopedia. I tried really hard to read it through from start to finish, but it was just too much. It's not really designed for that, unless you're a mythos scholar. But even casual fans of Call of Cthulhu can easily recognize that this is an important entry in the 7th edition library. Just make sure you bookmark that page that has the pronunciation guides. Thanks as always for watching, this is Dave signing off. See ya.